Thank you so much for that great intro, Sunny. So I'm Nova, and um, I am here to talk about The Walls Around Us, which just came out this spring from Algonquin. And this is a young adult novel, a YA novel. And you know, I've said this before in, outside of this room, but I'll say this here. I write stories about teenagers, uh, most specifically teenage girls. But that doesn't necessarily mean that my books are for teenagers. My books are for anyone who is interested in that, that moment in time, that point of being when you're, you know, the, that urgent, frightening, exciting point of being a teenager, that point when everything seems important and dire, and you're, it seems like your whole life is about to start, although life has already started. And you know, that exciting point in life is what I write about. And that's what found its way into the walls around us. But also, what also found its way was some supernatural um, elements and some ghosts. So um, when I first started thinking of what I wanted to write next, as this is my fourth book, I was thinking, I really want to write a ghost story. And I didn't know, you know where, to, where to start with that. I just knew somehow I want to write something, you know, something that feels like a classic ghost story somehow, but is also really steeped in the real world. And you know, my inspirations, a direct inspiration would be Shirley Jackson, who I love. Um, we Have Always Lived in the Castle is a favorite book of mine. And of course, The Haunting of Hill House, which is really chilling and gave me a nightmare. <laughs> Um, so that's a, the direct inspiration, and also David Lynch films. Um, I'm a huge Twin Peaks fan, and what I love is the, that everyday place, that ordinary world or ordinary town, and then there's th some strange little oddity, some, some, something other, something odd, and I always like to, to play with that in my writing. So I was thinking about, you know, I want to write something surreal. I want to write something with ghosts. And I thought, I need a place. I need a solid place to set this story. Good ghost stories have a really strong sense of place. And what came to me around the same time, I was also watching a lot of, I, I didn't even know why at the time, watching a lot of documentaries about prisons, reading a lot about people incarcerated. It was just a, an interest of mine and something that I was just collecting. And I didn't necessarily know why. And then I thought, I can set this story, this ghost story, in a prison. And then I, you know, of course, because I write about teenagers, it could be a juvenile detention center. And of course, because I write about teenage girls, most specifically, it could be an all girls juvenile detention center. So I created this imaginary juvenile detention center far up in upstate New York. As Sunny said, I'm from the Hudson Valley, but this is a little farther north than where I grew up. Um, I imagined it to be on, on the top of a tall hill uh, with you know, gray stone walls and three lines of fencing and barbed wire. And um, you know, I, I imagined that originally it was a prison for adult men and that it was converted and renovated to house teenage girls who had committed you know, violent crimes, very serious crimes. So I had my place. I had this, this sense of where the story would be. And yet, for me as a writer, a place is not enough. What I need is a character. I need a person. I need a voice. So I needed to find my voice. And that's really how I start a story, is to find how the person telling the story is going to let us in into her world. I often write in first person. So, I was coming up with this character named Amber. She has been incarcerated in the Aurora Hills Secure Juvenile Detention Center since she was 14 years old. She was convicted of manslaughter for killing her stepfather. And I knew that, I knew that this would be my character, but I didn't know how she would speak. It's so important to know how she speaks. And so I began to write kind of strangely, um, kind of in second person. Mean, you know, meaning it, she's saying we instead of I. And then I realized that it wasn't a true second person voice. It was more that my character was telling everyone else's stories in addition to her own. She was seeing everyone else around her. She's the person you know, sitting at the table at the corner being very quiet, listening to everyone else talk and collecting their stories. 
And that's the kind of narrator that she exposed herself to be when I was you know, trying to invent her. Um, so around the time that I'm inventing, you know, thinking of Amber and thinking of this story that I knew I wanted to write, this ghost story in this prison, I got a, um, a writing residency, an artist residency, at the Malay Colony in uh, upstate New York, in Austerlitz, New York. And the Malay Colony is on Edna St. Vincent Malay, the poet's property. And there's actually the colony area, and then across the street is Steepletop, Edna St. Vincent Malay's house. Um, her grave site is on the property. It's just this, this kind of um, refuge away from things. And it houses, you know, you can get a month-long residency, and it's for writers and artists of all disciplines, composers. So I had this residency for November, and November, I think, of 2012. And all I knew going up there is that I wanted to write this book. And I had this character, but I didn't have any pages. I didn't have any start to it. It was you know, just this like kernel in my head. And I had this month-long period to write it at the Malay Colony. And when you get an artist residency like this, there's no one looking over your shoulder. Like, there's no one, you know, at the end of the week, like, how many pages did you write? Or at the end of your stay, asking even to see what you've done. No one is checking up on you, which is a wonderful sense of freedom that you can use the time however you want. But at the same time, there's that pressure that you give yourself. You know, I was going away from home for four weeks to produce something. And so my goal was, I am going to write so much. I'm going to make so much progress in this book. Uh, I, you know, I had a really high standard for myself on what I wanted to produce. But when I got there, you know, things don't always work out as you hope, and, and creativity is hard to rein in. And I kept writing, trying to write in Amber's voice, and I kept getting stuck, and I kept writing pages I thought were awful. I kept throwing them out, just feeling really, you know, this is not right. I couldn't find the way into the story. So, my time there became, you know, I would sit down at my desk and try and write in the morning and just be really focused. And I would write, you know, awful things that I hated that were not worth keeping. I'd read for a little bit. I'd try again. And then at the end of the day, this was in November, so the, the before sunset, before dinner, I would take a walk outside in the, in the property. And kind of just like warring with myself and angry with myself, like, you're not getting anywhere. What's going on? Um, so there was this trail on the Malay Colony property called the Poetry Trail. And along the path in through the woods is, are these poems or excerpts of poems by Edna St. Vincent Malay, just like little signposts on the side. And I would walk along and, and read, read these poems every day, just kind of like absorbing them again and again. And I should say this is upstate New York in the fall during hunting season. So the artists were told, if we want to go walking alone, wear like something bright colored. So I'd be like walking the poetry trail with this bright orange vest on <laughs> over my sweater, um, you know, watching the sunset through the trees. Uh, no one else was ever on the trail when I was on it. And I would walk all the way down to the end, you know, feeling, starting off feeling really bad about my progress during the day, but kind of like stopped thinking about it and just you know, sometimes ideas come when you're not forcing them. Um, just kept walking, and Edna St. Vincent Millay's grave is at the end of this trail, as well as her mother's grave. And I would just, you know, sit there and, and think for a while, and then go back in, and that would be the end of the day. Um, and then we'd have dinner. And toward the end of my residency, I began to, something clicked. And I realized that I had found this voice for Amber. I had a phrase. All I knew is that it would start with, we went wild. I had three words. Um, and you know that could be anything in this story. I knew it would set in a detention center. So I was thinking, this could be a riot. This could be, I don't know, like what, what crazy thing is happening in which these girls go wild inside the walls of this uh, juvenile detention center. So I started writing. And I got a sentence. I got a paragraph. And that's all I got. I basically spent a month writing one paragraph. Um, uh, and, you know, and this is like writing every day, trying very hard. But this one paragraph 
led me into this story. This was the voice that I was looking for. This was the entryway into you know, this world. This was everything I needed. And in fact, as you'll hear, because I'm going to read from, this, read from it and you'll hear this paragraph, the paragraph that I wrote there in the first draft ended up being almost exactly the same in the final book after all the edits it went through and revisions and working with my editor. I think there were maybe like two word changes or something. But it ended up being the exact right way to tell this story after all that searching. And even though I went home thinking, oh, you know, I, I, I went away for a month and here I have one paragraph, uh, it really was the right thing for this book. You know, sometimes things happen very, very slowly, and sometimes it takes you an entire month of writing every day to come up with one paragraph. <laughs> so um, I thought that I would read from the first chapter, and you'll get a sense of Amber's voice, and you'll also hear the paragraph, but also <coughs> what happens after the paragraph, where it led me. And you'll recognize the three words. We went wild. We went wild that hot night. We howled, we raged, we screamed. We were girls, some of us 14 and 15, some 16, 17. But when the locks came undone, the doors of our cells gaping open, and no one to shove us back in, we made the noise of savage animals, of men. We flooded the corridors, crowding together in the clammy, cooped up dark. We abandoned our assigned colors, green for most of us, yellow for those of us in segregation, traffic cone orange for anyone unlucky enough to be new. We left behind our jumpsuit skins. We showed off our angry, wobbly tattoos. When outside the thunder crashed, we overtook A-wing and B-wing. When lightning flashed, we mobbed C-wing. We even took our chances in D-wing, which held suicide watch and solitary. We were gasoline rushing for a lit match. We were bared teeth, bald fists, a stampede of slick feet. We went wild like anyone would. We lost our fool heads. Just try to understand. After the crimes that had put us inside, after all the hideous things we were accused of and convicted of, the things some of us had done without apology, and some of us had sworn we were innocent of doing, sworn on our mothers if we had mothers, sworn on our pets if we ever had a puppy dog or a scrawny cat, sworn on our own measly lives if we had nobody. After all that time behind bars, on this night, we were free, we were free, we were free. Some of us found that terrifying. On this night, the first Saturday of that now infamous August, there were 41 girls locked up in the Aurora Hills Secure Juvenile Detention Center in the far northern reaches of the state, which meant we were one shy of full capacity. We weren't yet 42. To our surprise, to our wide-eyed delight, the cells of B-wing and C-wing, of A-wing and even D-wing, had come open. And there we stood, a thunder of thudding hearts in the darkness. We stood outside our cages. We stood outside. We looked to the guard stations. They were unmanned. We looked to the sliding gates at the end of our corridors. They were wide open. We looked to the floodlights ringing the high ceiling. The bulbs had gone dim. We looked, or we tried to look. It was the way our bodies pulled, through the window slits and into the storm pounding outside all across the compound. If only we could see past the triple fenced perimeter, over and beyond the coils of barbed wire, past the guard's tower, past the steep road that plunged downhill to the tall iron gate at the bottom. We remembered from when the blue painted short bus from the county jail had carried us up here. We remembered we weren't so far from the public road. That was when it hit us, how little time we were sure to have before the corrections officers returned to their posts. Maybe we should have been sensible about our sudden freedom, cautious. We weren't. 
We didn't stop to question the open locks, not then. We didn't pause to wonder why the emergency lights hadn't blinked on, why the alarms didn't blare. We didn't think either about the COs who were supposed to be on night duty, where they could have gone, why their booths were empty, their chairs bare. We scattered, we spread out, we pushed through barriers that were always locked to us before. We ran. The night burst open the way a good riot tends to, when it takes over the yard and no one knows who started what or cares. The shouts and screams, the whoops and wails, 41 of the worst female juvenile offenders in the state set loose without warning or reason or armed guard to take us down. It was beautiful and it was powerful, like lightning in our hands. Some of us weren't thinking and only wanted to kick in the glass fronts of the vending machines in the canteen for snacks or pillage pills from the clinic to get a fix. Some of us wanted to pound a face in and jump someone, jump anyone. It didn't matter who. A couple of us simply wanted to slip out back under the murky cloud covering and shoot some hoops in the rain. Then there were those of us, the ones with brains, who took a breath and considered because with no COs coming at us with clubs out, no alarms bleeding or intercoms crackling commands to hurt us back to our cells, the night really was ours for the first time in days, weeks, months, years. And what's a girl to do with her first free night in years? The most violent among us, the daddy killers, the slitters of strangers' throats, the point-blank shooters of pleading gas station attendants would later admit to finding a sense of peace in the plush darkness, a kind of justice not offered by the juvenile courts. Sure, some of us knew we didn't deserve this reprieve. Not one of us was truly innocent, not when we were made to stand in the light, our bits and cavities and cavity fillings exposed. When we faced this truth inside ourselves, it somehow felt more ugly than the day we witnessed the judge say guilty and heard the courtroom cheer. That was why a few of us hung back, didn't leave our cells where we kept our drawings and our love letters, where we stowed our one good comb and stashed all our Reese's peanut butter cups, which were like gold doubloons up in Aurora Hills since we didn't have access to cash. Some of us stayed put in the place we knew because what was out there who would keep us safe on the outside? Where really would a girl from Aurora Hills who disappointed her family and scared off English teachers and social workers and public defenders and anyone who tried to help her, a girl who terrorized her neighborhood, who was as good as garbage, she'd been told, who was probably best left forgotten, she'd read this in letters from home, where was a girl like that to go? A lot of us did try to run, even if it was only habit. Some of us had been running all our lives. We ran because we could and because we couldn't not. We ran for our lives. We still thought they were worth running for. Most of us didn't get far. We got distracted, overexcited, overcome. A couple of us came to a stop somewhere in one of the hallways outside our designated wing and sank to the cracked and pitted floor in gratitude as if we'd been acquitted of all our crimes, our records expunged. This felt like everything we dared let ourselves dream when the taunting fantasies slipped in between the bars. Wishes for fast getaway cars or Rapunzel ropes to climb out the narrow window openings. Pleas for forgiveness, for vengeance, for glittery new lives on some far off Riviera where we'd never again have to face hate or law or pain. It was happening to us. We never did believe it could happen to kids like us. Some of us cried. There we were, set loose on the defenseless night, instantly wanting everything we could imagine, to thumb a ride at the nearest freeway, to call an old boyfriend and get laid, to have a never-ending breadstick feast at the Olive Garden, to sleep under fluffy covers in a large, soft bed. That August marked my third summer at Aurora Hills. I'd been locked up here since I was 14. Manslaughter, I pled innocent. I stuffed myself into a skirt and sheer hose for trial. 
My mother turned her face away when I was found guilty and hasn't looked my way since. But it's not my arrival I find myself thinking about now that we have so much time to sit here thinking. It's not the judge's ruling and the deafening years of my sentence and how I landed here because not one person believed me when I said I didn't do it. I let go of all that a long time ago. It's this one night that I keep coming back to, that first Saturday in August when the locks couldn't hold us, that brief gift of freedom we'd take to our graves. I get hung up on it sometimes. And what if things had gone another way? If I'd made it past the gates and gotten out? If I'd run? Maybe I would have made it over the three sets of fencing and down the hill to the free patch of road, and my part in this story would be over. Maybe all that was about to come tumbling at us after this, someone, would have, someone else would have to bear witness to. Someone else would have to do the remembering. <coughs> Because that was the night we went wild. I remember how we fought, and we cried, and we hid, and we flung ourselves through windows, and we pumped our legs with everything we had, and we went running as far as we could make it, which wasn't far. On that night, we felt emotions we hadn't had a taste of for six months, 12 months, 11 and a half weeks, 909 days. We were alive. I remember it that way. We were still alive, and we couldn't make heads or tails of the darkness, so we couldn't see how close we were to the end. So that's the first chapter of The Walls Around Us, and that's you know, Amber speaking and bringing us into the story. But you got a hint in the introduction that um, this book has been called, and I admit I did not come up with this. I am not a marketing genius. Um, the um, Orange is the New Black meets Black Swan, or Orange is the New Black Swan. And so you might be wondering, <laughs> right? And whoever came up with that um, hashtag, thank you. <laughs> um, so Orange is the New Black Swan. So you must be wondering, where is the Black Swan reference in this? So the, you know, half of the story takes place inside the prison walls at Aurora Hills. But the other half of the story takes place outside. And the narrator for that half of the story is an 18-year-old uh, ballerina named Violet, who is about to head off to uh, New York City to live the life of her dreams. Everything is coming true that she wanted and worked for. And yet she is holding on to a very tangled, complicated, awful secret. And her, uh, she, her best friend, who used to be a dancer with her at, at the ballet school where she studied, ended up being uh, convicted of murder and sent away to the Aurora Hills Secure Juvenile Detention Center, where she was the cellmate of Amber. So that's how the two stories converge and are connected. And Violet's story actually takes place two years later. And there, you know, there is a distance. She's about to, to leave town. And I'm just going to read you a little bit from her voice to give you a sense of the violet section. Um, this is not a whole chapter. So what's happening right now is Violet is standing backstage, uh, about to perform for the last time for her town's uh, ballet recital, the summer, the summer recital. And she's about to perform a solo. And she's, of course, thinking of her former best friend, Oriana, who she calls Ori and thinking how Ori was a better dancer, and if she had been here, how different it would be. And she's also thinking about how glad she is to get out of here. For Ori, dancing came naturally, without a nervous stomach or worries if she'd forget the steps. She danced like it was meant to be, in a way that couldn't be copied, no matter how carefully I watched her move, mirroring my body after hers and trying to get my limbs to loosen up and act more free. She had this vivid spark of life in her, wanting out, and you could see it clear when she took the floor. I'd never witnessed anyone move like that. I guess I won't ever again. If Ori and I were dancing a duet tonight, she for sure would have been better than me. The audience would have basked in her, loved her, followed her light across the stage. My light would have been background. That's the truth, or it could have been. It's no longer the truth anymore. I let the curtain drop. I'm on. I hear my cue. 
I take my first steps out onto the stage, and next I hear her voice, what she would have said to me had she, had she been here. Breathe, V. Go be amazing. Go show them. Let them all see. She used to say things like that to me all the time. I'm at my mark. The darkness lifts, and my body lifts with it. And I'm tall now, as tall as Ori, because she had only a couple of inches on me. Taller even, because maybe since she's been gone, I grew. I'm balanced on point, on one leg, without a tremor, without sway. The spot of light circles me, and I'm growing warm inside it. I wonder how I look from out there in the audience to those strangers in the seats who know me this way only, who have no idea. I don't need a mirror to tell me. I look like I belong up here. I've got new Grishkos on, broken in this morning by massaging the shank and slamming the hard cast of the box into a door. My mother sewed the ribbons on with the tiniest stitches. No one could ever hope to see them. My hair is pin slick with shine to my head, and the tutu is a rigid ring around my middle, not as flimsy as it might seem. I'm entirely in white. I wanted it that color. I asked for it. The audience holds its breath for me. Ori's not the one up here. I am. The audience eyes my bent and poised leg, my arms molded in a graceful line over my head, my lifted and lengthened spine. All my weight is on a single toe. I hold. At least a dozen people watching from the wings want me to fall, and I'm not falling. Now comes the building crescendo of music, every little increment of movement from my body studied in mirrored reflection, coached and corrected into place. It may not be as freeform as Ori would have done it, but it's impressive because I'm so precise. I make no mistakes, not a single one. People in the audience can't hear the clomp of the brand new shoes as I touch weight to ground between each whip-fast pirouette. Or if they do hear, if they're seated close enough to the stage to hear, they ignore it. They want it our secret. They want me to win. But there's another secret. Inside, past the tool and the skin-tight stretch of fabric going three layers deep, I've got things I can't talk about, things Ori knew and only Ori knew. If you peel away the first layer and the second layer and the third layer, underneath would be something ugly, something broken, eyes clawed out and blood still clinging to her neck, her arms, her face. Sometimes I think I still have the blood on my face. There's this thumping, and it's not my pristine pair of point shoes touching floor for the first night in their short lives. It's what's going on in my head. It's a stampede. It may look like I'm dancing, but I'm somewhere else. I'm out there behind the dumpster in the tunnel of trees, and I'm screaming and flinging my arms, and dirt is everywhere, and rocks and twigs and leaves and blackness, the whole world getting knocked out like a set of teeth. I'm out there even now, as much as I'm in here, before I know it, I reach the end of the choreography. I can barely keep it together, but still I finish my solo with a flourish, poised on one rock-solid leg. Silence. They say nothing, do nothing. I can hear them all breathe. Then it happens. The seats creak and shift, and people rise to their feet. I've given them everything. I've given them too much this time. And then I realize, it takes me a moment to realize, these people really have no idea, do they? I showed them, and they couldn't see. They start cheering for me. These people, family, friends, strangers, all those innocent strangers, they stand on their feet for me, and their hands smack and smack with increasing violence, and they shower me with noise, like they wish I never had to leave this town or this stage. They're praising me. They're showing me how much they love me and have always loved me, no matter what. Look how blind they are. They're giving me a standing O. So that's Violet, the other voice in the story. And so much of the writing of this book for me was about exploring you know, guilt and innocence and who really is guilty and who really is innocent and what happens when one is mistaken for the other. So that is introduction to the book. And I think we'll, we'll have a, a little bit of discussion, and then they'll open for questions if anyone has questions. So one that struck me was just the voices of poor Violet and Emma are so very different. What did you have to do to yourself to get in each of the girls' heads? 
you know, it's really hard you know, f writing a first person voice, trying to sound like someone, and then you get so, you inhabit it so much that then everything you write sounds like this person. So it's hard when you're switching between two different voices. So for me, I actually, you know, I tend to write my books in order. So this is a problem when you're switching chapters. Um, I really, in this book, it's, it's more like sections instead of alternating chapters. But even so, I would be so into Amber, and then I would move into writing Violet, and like some of Amber would slip in. So I ended up having to separate the book into two pieces and write just the Amber story straight through and write just the Violet story straight through. And I actually gave myself rules um, that always helps when, you know, when I'm trying to, to write something. It's it, down to the specifics of this character is not allowed to use adverbs. And this character is allowed to have semicolons and m dashes. And like just down to like the sentence level. Um, you know, this character can have more casual language. This character can have flighty um, diversions in, the, in, her, in her thinking and get caught up in her head. And so I really, you know, I, and I had a list on the wall of like the things Amber was allowed to do and the things Violet was allowed to do. And even down to, you know, editing like a later draft, I realized that sometimes I would slip. So I would, you know, <laughs> no, no M dash. Um, and I would have to switch it, but that helped. And also um, just, being, just being in the voice of that character and reading it straight through, as long as, and I know a lot of writers do this, as long as playlists. You know, I had very specific songs that went with, with each character and e sometimes even each chapter. So when I was working on a chapter, even down to revising it, like in the third draft, I would put on the song that went with that chapter to remind myself of the feeling of writing it and remind myself of Amber or Violet. So can you give us a sample playlist for each girl? Um, you know, I should put that online. <laughs> I should put that online. I would say, um, I could say that Amber's Amber's songs were more dreamy. You know, her voice, her voice is, you know, more poetic and more like, you know, lyrical. And so her songs were slower and 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 dreamier and Violet's songs were angry. You know, if I had an a, like angry music would would go with Violet. Anything and it didn't have to be anything that she necessarily would listen to. You know, it would just be something that, that had like that power of punch in the in the lyrics or the song or just something to like make me mad when I was writing because I felt like that anger kind of was needed when I was writing her voice. But I should put up a playlist of, of the two different characters. It might be interesting. I think yeah. So. Um, does that make you a method writer then? <laughs> a method writer? Uh, you know, maybe. I, you know, maybe I think part of it, when you're writing first person voice, you're really trying to inhabit a person. You're really trying to see the world through that voice. I think you know bad first person is just you know some you know you're writing I and it could be she it could just be easily changed and you're not feeling it from that character in that case you know don't even bother you know just use, use third person is my opinion if you if you're using first person in the right way you're saying everything the way this person would say it you're noticing things in the room that that person would notice and only that person would notice. And the feeling of being who that person is comes through in how her side of the story is told. So you have to really get close to a character. And maybe that is kind of method writing. <laughs> That's funny. I was actually hoping for a story where you yourself lost yourself in a prison. And like <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't do that. But one, one thing I would do when writing this book specifically was I live in a small apartment in Manhattan. And I, I have um, a writing space where I go to, which is a, a loft space, uh, the writer's room in Manhattan, which is wonderful, where I, you know, I rent access and have access to a desk. But there are people around. You know, sometimes I write in cafes, but there are people around. And this, this book could get really intense. And this book could get really you know, dark and, and, and emotional. And I couldn't be around all the people. So I made, in our bedroom, in our tiny bedroom, uh, a tent <laughs> over my desk. So it was like just this like, and it was covering the window too. It must have been awful. Um, just this whole tent area in the, in the corner. So if I went into my desk, I could see nothing. And I was just like covered by this dark tent. And actually, one of the most intense scenes, the, a murder scene that happens in this book, was written in the tent. And even when I, I, I had to leave the tent up when we were revising, when I was revising the book, because I, you know, I needed access to that space. 
you know, that contained space where it was just me and the story. I couldn't even see anything. You know, there were no lights in the tent. It was just dark and then my computer screen. And then I would go in there to revise this really intense scene. So. <laughs> and how did you come up with all the other inmates, like all the other girls, the personalities, and the, the different crimes? It almost reads a little bit like it's from Chicago, except <laughs> there's no singing dancing. <laughs> I, I love Chicago, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I thought of all the possible you know, crimes, many of them violent, that would lead a girl to be locked up in this place, and her circumstances, and what, you know, what, you know, if what privileges she didn't have, or like what would lead her to be left here, to be left here. And so many of the the girls, it's like they they're considered to have no future, and even if their sentences end, you know, what happens to them after when you have this, you know, when you've when you've spent all this time incarcerated in this place. And so I, you know, I thought of all the possible crimes, and then. You know, I thought of the girl who might have committed this crime or was accused of it and, and didn't. You know, everyone, it, there's a point in here where it says they all say they're innocent. Some of them are innocent, some of them aren't innocent. Um, and it, so it was really, it was kind of fun and interesting to create these girls who had done, the, had these terrible mistakes and ended up here. And, you know, there, there, there are quite a few of them, and I feel like I could have, you know, gone and written whole sections, whole chapters. About, about them and their stories. I could have kept going. <laughs> so The Walls of Promise is your fourth novel, and it falls on the, a lot, falls on the heels of, um, let's see, Danny Noir, which be, was reached as a paid quote, mm -hmm. um, Imaginary Girls, and Seventeen and Gone. Mm -hmm. just, so if I were just being very literal, looking at just the titles, it seems a common theme is disappearing. <laughs> That's very astute, yeah. And I actually, the book I'm writing now has, has a little bit of that theme as well. I think that's something that I've always written about as a, as a girl. And I think when I was younger, because I've always written, I've always wanted to be a writer. And I think for me, um, it was a way to talk to people. It was a way to speak. I was so incredibly shy when I was young. I was that kid in class who couldn't speak. You know, I was called on in class and I would turn bright red and just very uncomfortable. It's amazing that I'm standing up here in front of this room talking. Um, I would never have seen myself doing something like that. And I think the writing is the way I found myself able to communicate. And a lot of it was, you know, like, I'm, you know, I want to disappear. I want to be invisible. And I think that theme, you know, those were stories that I wrote when I was younger, but that theme has, has translated to all of my books in, in interesting ways. You know, different ways of attacking it, different ways of finding myself speaking about that. So that's <laughs> that's great that you brought that up. <laughs> um, so how does that theme come to play in the most of this? Because if you just go by the title again, solely the title, it seems like it's the most concrete. They can't get out. The walls yeah. around them. Yeah, um, the walls around us. I mean, really, the way of what happens to you know a, a teenager, a young kid, when you know they commit a crime like this and are basically their whole life changes. They're sent away to, you know, a juvenile detention center to do time and it's almost like their entire old life has disappeared. Who they were has disappeared. And a lot of the thought, you know, of these prisoners is, you know, what is my life when I get out? You know, what is my life after I do I do my time? Is this mark ever, you know, is is this still on me for forever? So there was there's a lot of that and then there's also, you know, sometimes in my writing you know, I like to play with magical realism and fantastical things, and you know, the disappearing can be quite literal. <laughs> People actually can disappear and have in my books, so I won't give any more away. <laughs> um, is there an author whose career or body of work you'd like yours to look like? It Ooh. Um, okay, I'm. I'm just going to be honest and say this, even though she's a friend. Um, I greatly admire the YA author Libba Bray. And what I admire about Libba is she's so incredibly talented with, uh, with the range of her work. So she has written you know, historical fantasy. Her latest uh, series, The Diviners, is 1920s New York with the occult and politics and sweeping epic stories, as well as satire and, and funny things. And, 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 first person, beautiful, voicey things. And I look at her and I think, you know, if only I could find a way to have that kind of range as a writer and to be able to explore everything so honestly where it still feels like me in every book that's different. And I admire that so much, but I also admire 
how she carries herself in this industry, how helpful she is to you know, fellow writers, and, and how wonderful she is with her fans, and how open she is. And so I, you know, I very much think you know, I would love to, to find a way to, to you know, build a career like Libba's one day, and to have, to have published the kind of books that she publishes. I think yours is off, too. Marvin, it goes to Just going back to the walls around us, was, was there a reason why you chose Skrbinski's Firebird as the, as the ballet? Um, so yes, so in the story, Violet is, in, in the past, they were performing the Firebird as the summer showcase ballet. And Ori, her best friend, was cast in the, the important starring role of the Firebird, which was the best the best um, role that Violet wanted and she didn't get. So for me, you know, sometimes this book, I will tell you, is complete fiction. I was never in a juvenile detention center. Um, I am not a ghost. <laughs> I mean, this is like completely made up. But things from my real life do end up in my books. And so uh, the ballet stuff is from real life. I, was a, I studied ballet from when I was five to when I was 16. I was not very good. I never would have been a professional uh, like, like Violet in this story. But it was just so much a part of my life. Um, you know, going to ballet class after school, going on the weekends, doing performances like this. And the last performance that I did before I quit ballet to go hang out with my friends and go to parties, um, <laughs> which is the truth, that's what happened. Uh, the last ballet that I performed in was The Firebird. And I was one of the dancing maidens, which is the role that Violet actually does get. And I remember um, I, I had a very plain costume in comparison to the Firebird's costume. And we had um, like little, little bean bags, gold bean bags that we had to throw on stage. And this was like the greatest fear of mine that I, was, that I would not catch it when it came to me because I'm terrible at catching things. Uh, so it was just this very vivid memory that I remembered you know, the dancer who danced the Firebird, and that incredibly intense uh, dancing, the incredibly intense solo, it was such a memorable, you know, point in my life. And there was, there was this, she was trapped, this character was trapped, and just that feeling felt very connected to the walls around us. And also, the, at least the dancer who was in the performance that, that I was in, there was this anger that was all through her. And I just, it just really felt connected to, when I wanted to write this book. So when I knew Violet was going to be a ballerina, of course it had to be the Firebird. It had to be the, the ballet that I remembered, the last one that I danced in, but also the story felt right. And if Amber, Violet, and Ori were boys, how do you think your story would be different? That is such an interesting question. You know, it's funny, I, I, I most exclusively write about teenage girls um, and about girls, and I, I can't even imagine what it would be like for me to write this story from about three boys in a juvenile detention center. And I, I, I think maybe, you know, I mean, clearly that's a story that I would love to read. That was a, that's a story that another writer would be able to make so you know, vivid and wonderful. But for me, so much of my writing is about writing about the experience of being a teenage girl and all kinds of girls, you know, I, exploring all, all avenues. And so, I can't even fathom how that book would be if, if written by me. So I'm, I'm intrigued by the question, but I, yeah, I, I don't even know. I feel like it would be not a book by me. It would be you know, another, another worthy book, but not something that I would be able to do justice. Well, I also imagine yeah. the prison dynamics would be very different, yeah. and also even competitive dance world. Yes, the ballet stuff would be different. And there's, there's something really interesting to explore with you know, female friendship and you know, enemies and friends and how that can be the same thing, that can be the same person. Um, and I, you know, I, friendship with guys is probably different, but there's something really interesting with, with girls. And you know, there's the girls in the prison, they're you know, locked up in the prison, and there's the girls in the dance school. And you know, the girls in the dance school are just as vicious and mean as the girls in the prison, so. <laughs> That's a blast one reference, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's a metaphysical question. What are your thoughts on karma, regret, and how the supernatural would get involved? You know, I, um, I find that a lot of times when I'm writing these fantastical stories, there always is some kind of karmic re retribution. Like if somebody does something, you know, magical or has a power, there's always some, you know, consequence for that. 
Like I, I, in, in the worlds that I create, I can't imagine there not being some consequence, something that you do that you're not allowed to do that then you have to, to pay for. Uh, so I, I think that kind of philosophy has seeped its way <laughs> into, into my books. And so when I imagine something completely you know, fantastic and strange and, and, and in another world, I'm, I'm thinking of that, that, that rule. And I, that's come through in you know, my book, Imaginary Girls, and I think here in The Walls Around Us, there's that feeling of, of who deserves what and, if you, and what happens when someone who doesn't deserve it starts getting a lot, you know, getting all the good things happening to her. Is that really going to come through? And in real life, we know that a lot of times there's no retribution, and, and terrible people get wonderful things. But um, maybe in fiction, I have a way of correcting that a little bit. <laughs> this launchpad workshop I attended. <laughs> it's not often that you hear about writers going to a workshop that's funded by NASA for right. astronomy. But has, you know, what, did you, what was your experience like from that, and what did you take away from it? And how has it influenced mm -hmm. your work? Well, I should say that the Launchpad Astronomy Workshop is at the University of Wyoming every summer. Mm -hmm. And if you know, and it's open to writers who are interested in bringing in some science into their writing. Uh, specifically astronomy. So uh, you don't have to be a science fiction writer. You don't have to be a science writer. You know, I'm a YA writer who writes magical things. But I, you know, I had a, a book in mind that I'm st that's still in progress that um, about an astronaut. And I, I just I needed more basis to see, you know, <laughs> to make sure I wasn't making terrible mistakes, but also inspiration. And so um, I was really excited to apply and get the funding to go. And you know, every year, I think it's funded from different places. So the year I went, it was funded by NASA. I don't know who's funding it for next summer. But so I went. And really what it is is um, an intense week-long class on astronomy, like intense, like hours of learning astronomy. And, um, <laughs> and if you've taken an astronomy college course before, this, some of it might be you know, old hat to you. For me, it was all new. I hadn't taken astronomy in college. And so I had a lot to learn. But at the same time, you know, we moved past the basics and into a lot of what ifs with you know, terraforming Mars or like all these really interesting ideas. And I, I, I learned so much. I filled up notebooks full of notes. Uh, also, you get to, you know, you're with a group of, of fellow writers from different genres, uh, science fiction and fantasy writers. And there were some YA writers and just you know, short story writers. And we really bonded and connected while we were there. And there were also some visits you know, to a telescope to, to see the stars. And so it was, it was a really, really interesting week. And if, if anyone is listening to this and thinks that's interesting, there should be another one next summer. And I think the application's open in the winter. Um, and we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So, well, I was going to say, so like she said about uh, that I, I I got a chance to read it and I just picked it up. Thank but you. But <laughs> she, she said about how like you write so well, like you, you develop the other characters in the prison and everything so well. If you could, like, who is anybody in particular that any of the side characters that you made that you would like really love to go on a tangent with? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. Well, you know what's interesting about this book is is there's a this main central figure in this book called you know Ori or Oriana who doesn't get her own perspective, um, and she, her story is told through the eyes of Amber who is her cellmate, and then through the eyes of Violet who was her former best friend, and so you you know piece together this portrait of her through other people's eyes, which I always find so fascinating as a reader. I love that kind of stuff in a story. But then it leaves, you know, why did I not tell the story from Ori's perspective? A lot of readers have asked me, you know, why is there not Ori's perspective? Um, and I, you know, part of me was like, should I, there was one point where I was like, should I have letters from her? Should I add some of that in the story? I even think I tried and I couldn't find her voice. So I think, you know, I, I think I would, I would try a more secondary character, someone that, that nobody would expect. Um, there's, there's a girl who um, is kind of an outcast and eats her own hair. Her name is Kennedy. She might be interesting to explore. Um, there's, a, there's a girl who's surreptitiously, surreptitiously dealing drugs. Her name is Peaches. She might be interesting to explore. I feel like any one of them 
might lead to something, but it would be a whole separate story. It would be her story, and then it would, you know, touch the other one. Yeah, but that's, you know, it's interesting. There's, there's a lot of vivid possibility if I ever wanted to, you know, write something beyond this. But then again, my stories are always, like, standalone. They're meant to be, you know, just, just what they are. Even if they leave questions at the end, you know, the reader is, is left to ask those questions and, and determine the answers on their own. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like we're up to time. <laughs> yes. Thank yeah. you so much for coming in. No more Suma. Um, please pick up a copy of her book, The Walls Around Us, in the back of the room. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thanks.